the survival guide to life hey everyone how's it going we got another episode of the survival guide to life and uh this week our guest is felicia heath now for everyone who's tuning on in felicia um just really quick if you could um just who you are and uh, some of the things you've accomplished hey sure thank you so much for having me omar I am Felicia Heath. I am a physician by trade. Specifically, I am a critical care anesthesiologist, so I work in the intensive care unit as well as in the operating room. In addition to clinical practice, I am also involved in hospital leadership. I am the medical director of ICU and anesthesiology departments, and I recently just moved into the vice president of medical affairs role at my facility. I'm also a mommy blogger at mixedfeelingsmama.com which was created when I became a mother and became overwhelmed with all of the immense emotions that came along with being a new parent, raising six children and trying to find balance and happiness between life and work. And I am now a debut author of a memoir just released a couple of months ago called Spirit of a Hummingbird, Memories from a Childhood on the Run. Um, that's really amazing. Uh, from the having the time to complete medical school and then still be able to complete all these endeavors. Um, now, what uh, made you or uh, what sort of gave the spark for you to write this memoir? Yeah, so the spark was really my husband. I have always loved to write and I always knew that my story was unique and special. I started to sit down and write and when I had about 30 pages, I showed it to my husband. I said, read this. What do you think? Is this real? Can I pursue this? And he was like, absolutely, yes. You need to finish it. And then he gave me the opportunity and the time and the support to be able to do so. So that was really the push to write it and get it done. Um, and the inspiration behind it was really my internal feelings around my childhood and how it transformed into something more positive. And I really wanted to be able to share that with, with the world. Um, if you could, um, uh, Felicia, I guess, yeah. um, just give us like a glimpse of uh, some of those memoirs to, uh, to kind of see what your mindset was like then and how it is involved into now. Sure. So I grew up as the daughter of a teenage immigrant mother from Vietnam and a father who was a prominent gangster in Boston. So I essentially weave both of their incredible stories into my memoir, which was filled with a lot of domestic violence, poverty, bullying, uh, generational trauma. And uh, all of this was during just about a decade where we live life on the run from law enforcement after my dad escapes prison in the late 1980s. So it's really a story of perseverance and ultimately resilience. Yeah. So, well, um, just in that itself, you know, I've had a few, um, uh, Vietnamese close friends and, um, you know, actually, one one of them, his um, family, his father was actually a gangster. So I could sort of have this glimpse of um, mm -hmm. what what it's like. So in being in that scenario and situation, how what sort of um, kept you going and kept you being motivated to to keep going to school rather than be like, oh, this is just my situation and like give up hope. Right. So my motivation to go to school actually, I think initially was a survival tactic. It was a, a way to escape from my reality of an, a, an abusive father, not towards me, but towards my mother, if you read the book and all of the negativity surrounded that was surrounding our family. It was a way for me to learn to read. And I really tapped into that because in a lifestyle of such chaos and, uh, and, you know, unknowns, it gave me a schedule. It allowed me to 
learn math, which I loved because it's very predictable. It uh, helps me read and get into books uh, and experience stories that were not my own. So school was therapeutic for me and I needed it at that time in order to heal. And, you know, later on it ended up serving me beneficially. So, um, Felicia, did you grow up as a, uh, as an only child or did you have any brothers or sisters? I have a younger sister and a younger brother. Okay. My, my brother's the youngest. Okay, so like uh, uh, like me then, I, I, I'm the youngest of two sisters. <laughs> oh, okay. So um, how now? How were were they affected similarly, or did they sort of like look up to you as their role model in um, this time? So it's interesting because I'm five years older than my sister, and I'm ten years older than my brother. So when I interviewed them for the memoir and kind of asked them about their memories and their stories, they really couldn't remember much of it. Uh, my brother couldn't remember anything because by the time my father was sentenced to prison, he was just a little baby. And my sister was just a toddler. So she didn't remember a lot, but I think the memories that stand out for me are the ones between my sister and I, because I did feel like through all of that, I grew up fast and I naturally became her keeper and her protector. Okay, then, no, that's interesting. So with with now having all these different hats to jungle, like uh, by uh, being there for your mother and then being there for your sister and now your brother, mm -hmm. and then still being able there to be there for yourself, how mm -hmm. how did you sort of manage yourself emotionally? And um, what did you sort of do to try from keeping you drained? I was really young during this. So I isolated a lot during the time, which was not healthy. But later I developed other ways to cope. But initially as a child, I was... Isolating, my, isolating myself, and I had convinced myself that I was my greatest savior, that if I couldn't be strong, then nobody was going to be strong enough for me, and I had to do it in order to survive and ultimately thrive. So there was this in, intense pressure and uh, responsibility that I felt for myself um, as well as everyone else, that I, I refused to let down. And then later on, you know, juggling all of these hats and doing everything, all of my childhood past has put everything in perspective. So nothing is that hard or that emotionally draining as what I went through. You know, I've been through so much that everything now is is minuscule compared to it. And that has given me a lot of perspective and grounded me and given me the confidence to say, yeah, I can definitely attack this or approach it or solve whatever stresses or obstacles that come my way. So uh, that, that makes a lot of sense. You could sort of say it's sort of... Um led you up to be able to do this and give you the mindset of uh, I can do this and uh, sort of not overwhelm you, rather uh, yeah. give you the reason of, oh, no, I can do this. Let me just take it one step at a time. Yes, absolutely. And sometimes I do have to remind myself because I'm so far out from that time and I'm in a different space now and a different life that Every once in a while, I do have to step back and just look at the big picture and say, you can absolutely do this. Look at what you look, how far you've come and what you've already been through and, you know, survived at the end of the day. So then um, going with that, then how do you sort of uh, manage your time now 
with being an anesthesiologist and, uh, you know, just being uh, completing your memoirs and being a mother, you know? I have a lot of help. <laughs> so I luckily do have a lot of help with the child care aspect. And then I just try to... Um, there are a couple of things that I have to do. I have to get in like a quick workout for the day to decompress, uh, knowing that I have to take on a lot and manage my time well and be proficient. And then I do take like five or 10 minutes to meditate afterwards. And then I just approach the day, you know, very, very early in the morning. And I just get through the list and, um, I, I manage my time the best I can. Usually I am like dashing out the door and then rushing, <laughs> rushing home to be able to say good night, but it all works out at the end. So um, then I guess s sort of what keeps you going every day to um, keep do doing more than you're doing now? My motivation are now my children. It's it's incredible the transformation that happens when you become, you know, a parent. Everything that I decide or consider doing, I step back and say, you know, one day when I have to tell this story to them and how am I shaping the world if I make one, one decision versus the other? And almost every single time when I look at that way, it has pushed me to do more because I do want to show them their own potential and how much better than me they could be. So do you also want to like, you also don't want to hide um, like who their grandfather was, right? You sort of want to no. use those lessons to yes. sort of expose them and show them this is what life is but mm -hmm. this is what life can also be. Exactly. Yeah, so I've luckily been able to, gr you know, grow up, become an adult, and, and empower, feel empowered by my story. Uh, and just, I was just talking about this. In just one generation, you know, my kids don't have to endure <laughs> much. So of course I want them to understand that because it's so huge in uh the development of your character and whether or not you have some grit and you know gives you so much perspective and gratitude for what what they have. Yeah, I and I, I could see that also it can um it, it's really key and essential when I think you said to develop their characteristics because if you look nowadays and you see um, certain second generation or third generation children mm -hmm. who have yeah. um, grown up in less like um, uh, struggle, yeah, the more entitlement and like yes. the, 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 the more me and the less of everyone is there. So mm -hmm. um, I think that's really good that you're doing that. And uh, I don't see, I, at least I feel like that's not looked into so much now. Rather, it's like, oh, let me have some children and mm. let me get back to work. And when I, whenever I do have time, let me try to get in. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's so hard because we can't create that struggle for them, right? As their parents, I, I want to provide a lot for them, especially when they're so young. But one of the reasons I, I wrote this book, it's a, a record, it's a testament to where they came from and that life isn't always like this. And it's difficult to come up with a parenting strategy to show them that it's not all about them. So this book hopefully will help in that process. So no, um, but, um, what what do you sort of see as in like within a ch uh, within a child as in you know wanting to give them the things that you never had compared to like overcompensating like how do you draw the line 
and like um because for any like new parents that are listening because uh, i i remember you saying when you uh when you became a new mom you started a group <laughs> to help out new moms yeah i started a blog because i couldn't well one because i felt like i was totally losing myself when i had my first child it was like all about the baby and their needs and you have this all of a sudden overnight you have this responsibility of raising a life <laughs> and their safety and happiness and health and it was just so overwhelming for me but i knew that what being a mom wasn't the only role i wanted to play and that i served more purpose in other areas like you know medicine and and being an author so um I I think my husband does help me to say, you know, step on the brakes a little bit. You know, I try to tr well, I try to, you know, show them as much culture as possible. Um, you know, be in places where there are different languages and we go to a lot of museums and we try to read books about uh minorities and their accomplishments and what they went through in order to get there uh there are like some great uh stories about immigrants you know four kids so i think books help me a lot and I'll, i have to do a lot of research actually <laughs> to find the right ones that tell that kind of story and then i i also try to explain things you know, they're all young. They're, they're three, two, one in five months. So, okay. <laughs> you know, I'm learning as I go, but you know, when they say, when I, they say, mommy, why do you have to go to work today? I say, you know, I don't, you want me to help people get home to their mommies and daddies get well enough to their mommies and daddies. So it's not all about them. It's about, you know, other people so yes, I, I'm not going to be home today, but that's because I'm helping someone else to try to help them understand that it's not all about them and their sacrifices, me not being around. The, I think that's really great, especially at a young age to uh, be mm -hmm. able to instill that into them. I feel like um, uh, a lot of the younger ages is, is like... Um, not like um, frowned upon, but really neglected. And people really wait till more of the later years, till they're older to sort of yeah. do these things. But I feel like the younger they are, the more sponge-like and easier it is for them to absorb these types of um, ideals and mm -hmm. um, characteristics. Yeah, I, I think you're spot on with that. And I feel like it starts young their their self esteem their personality how they see the world starts so young uh it's amazing to watch them you know so i try to create conversation that hopefully will you know nourish how they grow up to be when when they're adults so you you said you have um um four children right? are they all boys or are they a mix of boys and girls i have three girls my second child is a boy okay so uh, uh and then um with, with that uh, is there any like um loneliness the boy feels sometimes that maybe the girl <laughs> the girls are together um right now the older two you are very close like they share a room and they are old enough to have conversation and are interested in similar things so i don't think so i think he does okay being the only boy i do yeah. sometimes wonder though that if i because I, I raising girls i think is there's the expectation is different and I think about this, I blogged about this actually, you know, I have to constantly do 
tell my girls, because I, I feel like I, this is what I would have wanted, you know, that they can do anything, you know, a boy can do and that they are just as skilled. And there are so many children's books about girls and girl power and being trailblazers. And sometimes I wonder, you know, I don't, I might not give the same push for that and my boy. And then I'm like, does he need that though? Because it's a man's world. So it's hard. It's a difficult balance. I think about it all the time though. I think maybe he does need that, but more from his dad. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You, you know, he certainly gets it from his dad. And I think maybe that's where it's more natural for me to do it for my daughters. Yeah. Um, Because I always felt like that, like, um, even though they say, like, you know, the daughters are, like, closer to their dads and, like, boys are more mama, mama's yeah. boys. Yeah, you know? But I, I still feel like growing up, like, um, the kid, like, the sons more look at their fathers and, like, try to emulate them and likewise with daughters with their moms. Yeah, definitely. So, so do you still um, do the blog i do mm -hmm. okay and then I what is the, if you want to a, plug it oh yes it's www.mixedfeelingsmama.com and i started it a couple of years ago i post a monthly and it's just whatever i'm feeling that month so whether it's work-life balance me working during COVID and I was pregnant, uh, taking on leadership, which would take away time from my family, you know, raising mixed children in a predominantly white area, things like that, you know, whatever I'm feeling passionate about that month, I'll, I'll write it, I'll write about it. Uh, no, um, my, one of my cousins, um, she um she's the only doctor in the family and she became an anesthesiologist as well so i know oh, really? um uh, yeah and i know how difficult it is she's in um she's in dc um currently oh, wow. practice so um i was going to ask what um sort of wanted you to be an anesthesiologist compared to um other fields because i know like um it takes really long you know even after you complete your fellowship mm -hmm. and stuff yeah yeah, so I honestly think it stems from my childhood. There was like so much chaos and instability in my childhood. All I wanted was to bring stability to it. And then when I started medical school and started investigating which field I wanted to go to, the anesthesiologist, that's their role to create a safe and stable environment for their patient. So on one of the most important you know, days where they're undergoing a major surgery, my job is to keep them safe. It's to keep them as pain free as possible and stable through the entire process. So I think that's why I gravitated to that field. Okay. It was now, like a did, deep desire. Now, did your parents want you to become a doctor or? <sighs> Did, um, like, were they like, oh, uh, Felicia, we want you to be a doctor? Mm. Um, my dad, no. My dad thought it was ridiculous because <laughs> there's a part in the book where he's asked me how much would you make as an anesthesiologist, and he found it laughable. And that I, he, did, he didn't know why I spent that much time and invested that much money to go into debt in order to become a physician. <laughs> so no, not for my dad. I think my mom, yes, she, she knew that I really loved math and science. And she did, I think, put it out there. And some of that also made me go into medicine because it was very important for me to make my mom proud, you know. Um, and be a constant reminder that she also endured a lot. You know, being a Vietnamese immigrant during the war, a teenage mother in an abusive relationship, 
she was able to raise decent children. And a part of that for me was, you know, if I become a doctor and it's something that she can be proud of, like that's, that's a reminder to her every day that she did the right things. So did they immigrate here like after the, the Vietnam war? They immigrated here towards the end of the Vietnam war. Yeah. Both oh, okay. of them stayed at the a Malaysian refugee camp between Vietnam and the United States. So that in itself must have been an experience having to be in that camp and then coming here yeah. and, and then starting a life anew. And not only that, coming to America, being a new, and then yeah. being looked at as an outcast by being Vietnamese and having people think you're the, 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 the traitor or, you know, like the, the yeah. self, but rather you're, you're, you're not. So, um, I'm sure you probably asked your mom and like probably a little in your memoirs, like mm -hmm. talked about this, right? Like how it was for her to oh. leave her country and then come mm -hmm. into America. Oh, absolutely. So her story is, is incredible. I actually think her story is the more powerful narrative in my memoir. I do, you know, go back in time between her life and my life. Uh, and in order to be able to tell as much of her story as I could, she went through much more than I, I could ever, ever imagine after I talked to her about the struggles of the war, her leaving her family, being at the camp, and then arriving in the United States with no resources, zero, and not being able to speak the language. Um, and then, you know, essentially meeting someone also who spoke Vietnamese and feeling like, you know, this is, these are the people I belong with. And then later finding out that he was a gangster and uh, running away with him. She, she went through a lot and her, her story is mind blowing. So you, you can sort of say like some of your grit and like perseverance came from your mom. Yeah, I can 100% say that. And I wonder sometimes, you know, there is some research to suggest that resilience is possibly in your DNA. Uh, I, <laughs> that, I could definitely see that. Yeah, like there might be a gene for it. So I, one way or another, inherited some grit from my mother. <laughs> and uh, I feel like um, in in the especially in the south asian community uh like i myself i'm i'm, I'm uh, from sri lanka so it's uh -huh. not not too far from vietnam mm -mm. <laughs> uh, yeah. i think uh people in that uh, community they have a little more you can say grit compared to other uh, people f because of the circumstances they're in and um it takes more grit to be able to be in that type of scenario or situations. Yeah, I think so. I think it takes a certain type of person and grit in order to be in that situation, not only be in it, but, you know, survive and do okay in it, sustain themselves. Yeah. And then, um, so do, um, do you speak, um, Vietnamese? So I understand Vietnamese. I used to speak actually Chinese and Vietnamese. And then later on in life, I forgot both. Uh, but I do know more Vietnamese than I do Cantonese now. Okay. So is, is that something you look, um, are like looking to do with your kids? I always ask people this because um, I, 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 um, I'm curious to know how many people want to try to teach a second language at an early age compared to when they're older? So my mom does try to speak to them in Vietnamese. I would say that I have not done that, but I am very interested in other languages. So not Vietnamese, but, you know, they like, learn Spanish. And okay. our au pair is from South Africa, and she teaches them Zulu. Oh, wow. That's really great. Yeah. At a, so Spanish and Zulu and um, <laughs> intermittently Vietnamese. 
<laughs> so no, I, I think it's really important to expose, um, you know, um, languages and um, mm. just knowledge at an early age compared yeah. to just like rubbish and filth of like Nickelodeon <laughs> and Cartoon Network, you know? <laughs> Yo, absolutely. Like there's, there's definitely a balance. So, but I do try, I try. And I try to travel with them as much as I can so that they can see other cultures and, you know, be immersed in something else that's unfamiliar to them. Yeah, and giving them like new experiences, right? Like whether it yeah. be music or uh, sports exactly. or whatever, whatever it is. And then you don't know what they'll be good at or what they'll like. Yeah. So you kind of want them to be exposed to everything. Yeah, and I, I think about this too. You even are these exposures, even when they're really young and don't really understand them, but they're creating some kind of synapse, right? Like through their senses. So I had taken Skylar when she was nine months to Morocco. And I thought it was such a great place because it was like, you could smell the spices, you could hear the music. You know, when we, we went to the Sahara, we took her on a, like a camel ride through the Sahara desert and met with the nomads so they could teach us how they do their educational system. She was nine months. Who knows if that plays into anything, but I do think that like when you tap into their senses, there are some synapses that are being built in their brain that later on they'll say, wow, I really like this. I'm really drawn to this, but they can't really explain why, but they're just naturally drawn to it. So my goal is to just expose them to as much as possible so that, you know, when they make the decision, to commit themselves to, let's say, a career, um, that it's something that they really love. See, uh, I think that's what's really important. And um, um, it feels like to me that you sort of, before being a parent, you sort of did some research or like read some books and sort of try to get yourself into the mindset of like, what is this going to be like, where I feel like a lot of parents now sort of just have children and um are so not ready for it like i even remember being in high school and seeing the kids around me about to have children i'm like you're a child yourself and then like um yeah. i feel like um the more um attention that's delved into this uh because um the only person that's going to be neglected or lose out is the the kids that are to come mm-hmm yeah. And that's sort of why I kind of did this podcast. It's sort of like a, a way to talk to an uh, expert or um, in every field and mm -hmm. um, give a scenario out there. Maybe people who are listening to this who don't have anyone to talk to can sort of connect with it and gain some advice or uh, see something they have in a different way. Yeah, I love that. You know, I've been listening to your podcast over the last few weeks and you you certainly have a knack for tapping into that kind of stuff and not just talking about people's accomplishments, but having a, a deeper conversation, you know, more thought provoking and realistic people that can actually take something away from this conversation. Yeah, you know, and I think it's really um, important because, like, um, everyone has their successes, but then when we talk about uh, um, our losses, too, that mm -hmm. can sort of um, give someone inspiration who's yeah. about to give up and sort of keep them to keep going, you know? Yeah, definitely. Absolutely. So, and I think you and I have that in common, you know, between the book and the blog and your podcast, <laughs> you know, the ultimate goal is to try to help somebody. Yeah. I think that's why you became a, do a doctor, you know, like, you, yeah. like that, that's like, uh, in, I think it, it's the, it's like the, the hunters and the gatherers. I feel like mm -hmm. it's still like that in a way where like each person is there and, um, with their specialty, you know, and um, just um, now I was watching the the FIFA World Cup opening. 
Uh-huh. And and um, it was a man who had no legs, and he was walking up, and he was um, from Qatar, and he was talking to Morgan Freeman, and then he said, you know, um, we're so unalike, but we're here together, and like, what brings us together? And then um, he he like said um, he he recited some verse, and then he said like, you know, um, people are there in different tribes and um different um groups so we can learn from each other and um gain knowledge from each other so i think that's really essential like coming to america and having these different uh Mm -hmm. nations and tribes and like learning from each other and um seeing one another's struggles and uh using Mm -hmm. that as a way to keep going and uh trying to find uh you know solace in the in the darkness that's what was covid and like coming out of it right yes and just the human connection you know the human connection is like so powerful so just knowing that someone else is going through something similar to you and they were able to get through it um now um with uh, Uh, I had a question just like with how society was before and how it is now. Um, I was just curious with what your sort of strategy is or as you're going to leave it open with um, like I I thought it was really interesting and um, it was also really weird at the same time that Um, In kindergartens, they were having uh, drag queens, like, read nursery rhymes to kids. And I thought that was, like, um, pointless or at, like, such a young age. Why do you want to portray this? And I felt like maybe it could be left out and talked about at a later age, but kindergarten is really early. Mm Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, I, I I feel like there's probably a lot of different ways to expose kids to um, this, right? That, that yeah, to this. I'm not sure that that's if the that's... best way, but maybe that was their attempt, you know, to try to be inclusive. Um, because but I prob- f- no, I, I I don't like I don't want to. Um shame it or talk bad about it or anything Mm -hmm. like that but i just think at a young age at kindergarten that the the mind is so like malleable you know you i think that it would be better at maybe like seventh grade or eighth grade you know just getting into high school talking about Mm -hmm. it you know and maybe at that age would be better because they could understand it more yeah. Whereas this and age, ask questions and um right be, be curious in like a in a productive way. I think the, later on. Yeah, that's what I felt like too. I felt um, just not even in that, but um, even in um, the 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 usage of TikTok with children. You know, like. 12 11 10 and um the more time being used on phones and like when i even see my nieces and nephews like knowing how to use ipads and stuff it uh, it um i i feel like it's it's scary but it's good in a way that they know Mm -hmm. how to use the technology but then being so uh like you know you see it all the time like yeah, the kids will be screaming or something, and just to not hear them scream, you'll be like, "Oh, take the iPad," you know. <laughs> I think that might maybe a common thing when you're traveling because I do do that with my kids. Like, let's say on airplane, just to. <laughs> okay, so that's <laughs> save I the think passengers like save that passengers a headache. I know that these kids have to sit in one spot for a few hours and like the entire plane uh, is not going to have any peace. So I do do that. <laughs> no, no. I think that's, that, um, that's fine though. Like you're on a plane and it's like, um, uh, but I'm saying like to the, to like when you're at home or you're at the grocery yeah. store and like, yeah, it's all context. Right. Yeah. Um, and there, there has to be limitations to, to everything. 
Yeah, and that uh, that's where I like I'm like as for me I'm just trying to push that like you don't have yeah. to always like um have a screen in front of your child, you know, mm-hmm. like you can use books or have them yeah. play Le- Legos or if they want to play a, if they want to play a game let them play Minecraft or so you know something that yeah. uses a different part, you know what I mean? Yeah, and like we've been really into like kinetic sand right now. Oh, okay, I know what <laughs> like you're talking the, about. Yeah, like the texture and like yeah. creating shapes with it, and they've been really into that. Um, so we do a lot of arts and crafts in our house, and we have a ton of books. Like we don't even accept gifts for their birthdays. We only allow books or college donations. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. I think no, and like it, it, it's important because like I saw it in my own niece, like um. Uh, my cousin who was an anesthesiologist, she, um, her, her daughter learned the whole periodic table at age six. And I was like, oh, see, wow. I was like, it, that, and like, all she does is like really read. And like, um, she like, now she's like eight or nine. She's really into Tintin. So she reads a lot of Tintin books. Aww. So, but it, 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 it's nice when you see that other side where it's like, oh, it's not mm-hmm. someone who wants, and then, um. Uh, you you sort of want that, and then that's when I sort of realized, like, okay, it's not really the kid, but rather um, a mix of the kid and how the parents were to them. Yeah. So um, what would you say to, you know, any new parents out there who are maybe still in college and, um, you know, maybe overwhelmed and... uh, wondering if they can do this i would say it's really hard it's hard and it's okay like we don't talk about it being hard we talk about you know a baby being a bundle of joy and like the light of your life but it is hard (laughs) and um if you just happen to your love, your unconditional love, um, and your gratitude, you will be able to, you know, get through that, those sleepless nights, the stress, <laughs> the formula shortage, you'll get all through all of that. <laughs> if you can tap into the, at the end of the day, it's love, love is motivating behind, is the motivation behind, you know, parenting. So practice your patience, be grateful, and continue to spread the love. So then say you watch this this video, Felicia, um, like five years from now, what do you sort of say to your uh, future self? I would say you were meant for this. You belong here, so you keep walking in your purpose. And then um, two truths and w- one lie about yourself. It could be any truths and one lie, and I'm going to try to figure out which one's the lie. <laughs> okay. Um, I started writing a second book. I am planning a family trip to Greece. And we are thinking about having a fifth baby. Uh, Is the lie you're thinking about having a fifth baby? (laughs) The lie is I started a second book. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. Um, Is your husband uh, from Greece? No, my sister's getting married there. Oh, okay. So we're that, taking the whole family. Okay, that's nice. Uh, yeah. This is a beautiful country. I've never been. I'm super excited. And um, lastly, I guess if you could end us with a quote, sort of that's been uh, one that's been resonating with you recently. Recently, I read a quote from Angela Davis that is, 
I am no longer accepting the things I cannot change. I am changing the things I cannot accept. And I love that quote because it, it puts the power back into your hands. I, I, I really like that. Um, I feel like it goes uh, hand in hand with uh, one of these quotes I really like, which is like, no problems, only solutions. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So if you can, uh, um, Felicia, again, just uh, plug in your blog and all your social media outlets if anyone uh, who can can connect with you. Sure. So my Instagram, which is where I'm most active, is at Latin. Physically, mentally, spiritually, financially, consistently. The Survival Guide to Life.